Ronald Melnick was a senior scientist with the U.S. National Toxicology Program for decades. He led the design of the studies on animals exposed to cell phone radiation that was published in 2018. And he's a distinguished advisor to Environmental Health Trust. I want to thank uh, Libby for inviting me to participate in this conference and talk about the studies by the National Toxicology Program studies on cell phone radiation. My talk will involve uh, a brief outline about the National Toxicology Program. I'll discuss the exposure system, the design of studies, the results, and their application. Now, the National Toxicology Program began in 1978 as a means of bringing together various toxicity uh, groups within the Department of Health and Human Services into one roof. That roof included the uh, Food and Drug Administration, the National Institutes of Health, and CDC. The NIEHS is where the National Toxicology Program is headquartered, and it's in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. Now, the NTP receives nominations for studies from all sources, including federal agencies, labor, industry, the public. The nomination for cell phone radio frequency radiation came from the Center for Devices and Radiological Health of the FDA. The FDA requested toxicity and carcinogenicity studies in experimental animals to provide the basis to assess the risk to human health. And the reason for this was because at that time, exposure guidelines were based on protection from acute injury. This is short term from thermal effects or heating due to RF exposure. And they were concerned that this may not be protective against any non-thermal effects of chronic exposures. Now the, uh, the guidelines that were established in 1997 by the FCC are designed to protect against adverse effects that might occur due to increases in uh, body temperature. And the level was set at one degree centigrade from a measurement in monkeys. And this was equivalent to a dose of four watts per kilogram called the specific absorption rate. Uh, the specific absorption rate was equivalent to four watts per kilogram. And this is the rate of RF energy absorbed per unit uh, mass. It's also a function of the electric field strength, the tissue conductivity, and the uh, tissue density. From this, exposure limits were generated for the general population. And by dividing the four by 50, they came up with 0.08 watts per kilogram, averaged over the whole body. In addition, they increased that value by 20-fold to 1.6 watts per kilogram, averaged over any one gram. This is then the local tissue level. And the difference between this that is of concern is that if you hold an antenna next to your head, for example, if you're holding a mobile device, what's important for understanding organ-specific risk is what is that emission right next to where the antenna is located. If you divide it by the whole body uh, weight, you uh, do not get a sense of what the risk is to that local region. Therefore, the NTP was more concerned with the 1.6 watt per kilogram averaged over any one gram. Now, agencies request studies in animals for assessing human cancer risk because of similar processes. Every known human carcinogen is carcinogenic in animals. The exposures uh, are controlled so they can eliminate potential confounders and animal studies can avoid the need to uh, wait for sufficient human cancer before developing uh, public health protective policies. Now the objectives of the NTP studies were to test the assumption at that time that cell phone radiation at non-thermal exposure intensities is incapable of inducing adverse health effects. And the reason for this assumption or hypothesis was that radio frequency radiation does not have sufficient energy to break chemical bonds. Therefore, it was expected it could not cause DNA damage. Also, the NTP studies were designed to provide data on dose and incidents that could be used to assess human health risks. 
Now, a study was done prior to the NTP using a Ferris wheel exposure. There was a central antenna, and rats were located in these tubes that moved around that central antenna. And we felt that this was inadequate to understand the f full potential of radio frequency radiation because the animals were limited to a two hour exposure per day because they did not have access to food or water. So the requirements that we developed for the NTP was that we wanted to expose a large group of animals, such as 100 per group. The animals must be unrestrained, individually housed. They must have access to food and water. We wanted a shield system from uh, and a homogeneous uh, electromagnetic field environment. The power levels must not exceed the animal's ability to thermoregulate, and we used one degree centigrade as the markoff for that. The materials inside any type of chamber must have minimal absorption. The frequencies and modulations that were selected were those to reflect common use at the time, 900 and 1900 megahertz, and the modulations were CDMA and GSM since those were in use. The chronic studies would include three power levels and, uh, for, and a sham chamber for every sex and species. This is what the NTP reverberation chambers looked like. Behind this cage here is an antenna. There's a horizontal paddle and a vertical paddle, which distribute the fields to create a homogeneous uh, electromagnetic environment. Oops. Over here, you see two cage racks uh, inside that chamber, each ch cage rack can hold up to 50 rats. By exposing animals in this kind of condition, there's no limit on the exposure time. So we could increase the time uh, per day of exposure, but we have a limit on the exposure intensity. Now, we also work with uh, folks from Zurich at ITIS, and they conducted models of what exposures would be like uh, in an exper ex in a reverberation chamber, excuse me. With 12 polarizations, you can see over here at the 1900 or 1 1.9 gigahertz, in the rat, there is much absorption in the tail. And similarly for the, for the mouse, there's high absorption at 900 megahertz. Now we did not want to uh, overexpose the tails. We were interested in exposing the various organ structures. If you look over here, you can see what happens in the brain. The values shown here are how much the exposure in an organ deviates from the whole body exposure. So in the brain, the exposure for both rats and mice for the rat at 900 megahertz and the mouse at 1900 megahertz is very similar to the whole body exposure. We were interested in the brain since there had been reports of associations with cell phone use and brain cancer. Uh, the design of the studies had to demonstrate the validity of the uh, field uniformity. Uh, this was done using 216 simulation bottles scattered throughout the chamber and demonstrated very good uh, field uniformity. During the course of the study, there must be constant monitoring for field uniformity. The exposures were 10 minutes on, 10 minutes off for 18 hours per day. And the first study was a thermal pilot study to determine effects of different exposure intensities with both GSM and CDMA modulations on body temperature. Again, the restriction was one degree centigrade for rats and for mice of uh, different ages. Over here, you can see that uh, the rat body temperature is approximately 37 degrees at six watts per kilogram in aged male rats with both CDMA and GS and GSM. 
the six watt per kilogram maintain is within that one degree centigrade. This was the same for male and female rats. So with that, uh, pre-chronic studies were done just to be sure that the rats or mice could tolerate the exposure levels that might be used in the carcinogenicity studies. With the information from the pre-chronic studies and the uh, thermal pilot studies, exposure intensities of, for rats were 1.53 and 6 watts per kilogram, and for mice, 2.55 and 10. The chronic studies included a total of 90 animals per uh, of each group and sex. For rats, exposures began during pregnancy, uh, gestation day five. Mice began after weaning, and this was for up to two years. Also, at 14 weeks, there was an interim sacrifice to evaluate for DNA strand breaks in the brain, since there had been reports of that in previous uh, studies. So the first uh, uh, set of results that I want to show are here. And when you see stars in the sham uh, chamber group, that indicates that there is a significant trend. When there's the stars in an exposure group, this is an indication from a pairwise comparison between that group and the controls. And what you can see here is that for male pups and female pups, this is their body weights on postnatal day one, first day after birth, uh, that there's a significant downward trend in body weight, and there was a significant effect at the six watts per kilogram. Another effect that was observed was cardiomyopathy. This is a heart muscle disease. The incidence was elevated in male rats with both GSM and CDMA uh, here at the th three watt per kilogram and six watt per kilogram. But the severity of the cardiomyopathy also increased uh, in male rats. In female rats, there was an increase in incidence of cardiomyopathy at both the three and six watt per kilogram exposure levels. To analyze for DNA damage, we use what is called the comet assay. This is a procedure in which single cells are lysed. They're placed on an agros gel and subjected to an electric field. The negative side is on this side, the positive electrode, the anode, is on this side. And when there's fragmentation of DNA, the small pieces can migrate faster to the positive anode. And this creates a comet-like appearance. The larger this tail is, is an indication of the greater uh, effect on uh, DNA damage cr creating strand breaks. And the results from the comet assay are shown here where the red squares show significant increases in one or more exposure groups plus significant trends. You can see in the frontal cortex and in the hippocampus of male rats exposed to CDMA, there were significant trends and increased incidence, as well as in the frontal cortex of male mice with both GSM and CDMA. In female rats, there was a significant trend for CDMA in the frontal cortex, and what I've shown here in yellow boxes are uh, effects that were not significant, but twofold greater than, uh, the, uh, con than the controls. Getting on to the proliferative lesions, which are a combination of tumors and hyperplasias. Hyperplasias are considered to be uh, potentially preneoplastic lesions that can progress onto a tumor. The first case is the schwannoma, this is a tumor of the myelin sheath that surrounds the nerves. And there was an increase in schwannomas in both the GSM, a significant trend with both GSM and CDMA, with a significant elevation in the six watt per kilogram CDMA. There were also uh, Schwann cell hyperplasias, which are considered potentially preneoplastic lesions. They are proliferative focal lesions. And when we look at the combination of this, you can see that there are significant elevations. Uh, I should point out that the historical rate for schwannomas is about 1%. Uh, 
And there were schwannomas observed in female rats, but at a uh, lower incidence than in male rats. There were also observations of increased gliomas and glial cell hyperplasias in male rats uh, with both the CDMA and GSM. Again, the historical rate is approximately 1%. And when you look at the combination of tumor and hyperplasia, uh, it indicates a, 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 an effect observed on the brain glial cells. Now, one, one objection that has been raised by, in the media, as well as in some scientific papers, was that there was a significant difference in survival between the controls and the treated groups in that the controls were dying earlier and did not live long enough to uh, detect a tumorous response. The black, the black squares are the uh, control groups. And what I've shown here is where the two overlap. The open squares are the six watt per kilogram for the CDMA, which had the most potent response. And at week 93, there was no difference in survival. The difference existed after that. But the mean survival time was actually greater in controls than in the six watt uh, per kilogram group of CDMA. In addition, uh, in the controls, there were no glial hyperplasias or heart schwannomas in control rats. However, in animals that were on study, the, there were glial cell hyperplasias detected as early as week 58 and heart schwannomas detected as early as week 70. Therefore, I believe the survival was sufficient to detect cancer or precancerous lesions in the brain and the heart. Another effect just shown here is of the prostate gland. The NTP has never identified a prostate carcinogen. In this case, we see an elevation in the three watt per kilogram, which is significant. Uh, the historical rate for prostate gland car uh, tumors is approximately less than 1%. There was also increased hyperplasias, uh, and the combination of hyperplasias and tumors shows that there's a clear proliferative effect in the prostate gland in rats exposed to either CDMA or GSM. So now NTP has various categories of carcinogenic, uh, the evidence of carcinogenic activity. There's a clear evidence, obvious dose-related uh, increase. Some evidence indicates that these increases were caused by the agent. Uh, equivocal evidence indicates that there was a marginal increase that may be related to the exposure, but other factors also influence the evaluation. For example, were the tumors common or uncommon? Schwannomas and glial, uh, glial cell tumors are uncommon in rats. Also, were there proliferative lesions at the same site? And in this case, we did see proliferative lesions for both the uh, schwannoma and the glial cell. Uh, the NTP studies underwent a rigorous three-day peer review process of approximately 10 independent uh, outside reviewers from academia and industry. And the conclusions of the peer review that were adopted by the NTP was clear evidence for heart schwannomas with GSM and CDMA in male rats, uh, some evidence for brain gliomas, and this is comparing the data to the NTP criteria. For female rats, uh, those were both considered to be equivocal. For prostate gland, it was considered equivocal for GSM. So the key findings in the NTP studies for cell phone radiation was that it caused cancer and preneoplastic lesions in the heart and brain, proliferative lesions in the prostate gland, DNA damage in the brain, of rats and mice, heart muscle disease, and reduced birth weights. So recall, I, I, I indicated that the objective was to test the assumption. And when you look at these effects, the assumption that non-ionizing radiation cannot cause cancer or other adverse effects other than tissue heating is obviously wrong. Now in 2011, IARC, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, conducted an evaluation of 
non-ionizing radiation, radio frequency radiation, electromagnetic fields. In the IARC evaluation, the evidence in humans, this would be epidemiological studies, was considered to be limited that although there were positive associations observed in two studies, in multiple studies, one was the Interphone, a multinational study, and a number of studies conducted in Sweden by Hardell and his co-workers. Uh, the reason this was considered limited was that these were positive case control studies which have the potential for selection and recall bias. That is, in a case control study, uh, individuals might have reported greater use of cell phone uh, than they actually experienced. Also, large cohort studies of just general populations were negative. However, these have the potential for misclassifications. The evidence in animals was limited, and IR concluded that radio frequency electromagnetic fields are possibly carcinogenic to humans. Uh, this just gives the uh, category, how IR comes up with their the terminology of sufficient evidence and limited evidence, but I wanna move on. So when we, I look at the NTP studies compared to the IARC uh, report, the NTP identified cancers in the heart schwannomas and in the brain gliomas, whereas the IARC uh, conclusion of possibly carcinogenic to humans was based largely on increases, again, in glioma and acoustic neuroma, which is a vestibular schwannoma. This was in both the Interphone and the Swedish case control studies, the one I mentioned by uh, Hardell and his group. Since the IARC evaluation in 2011, there have been other studies, a few are just listed here. There was the finding of an increased risk of glioma in a French study. There was uh, the Canadian participation in the Interphone study reevaluated their own data for effect of selection or recall bias and found that the risk of glioma was not affected by selection or recall bias. And Phillips reported in England that the incidence of glioblastoma had doubled in the frontal and temporal lobes in England between 1995 and 2015. In addition, there have been other animal studies. Two listed here is the Ramazzini study, which also found an increase in heart schwannomas in male rats exposed to GSM modulated radio frequency radiation. And Lurkel reproduced a co-carcinogenic effect of radio frequency radiation at very low uh, 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 doses. This was in ethyl nitrosourea treated mice. This is a, an, uh, like a co-carcinogenic effect or a promotion. Uh, and I mentioned also mechanistic studies because when IARC makes an evaluation, they look at human studies, animal studies, as well as mechanistic studies. And oxidative stress has been detected very high frequency of studies that have been conducted. 93 out of 100 were reported. Now, oxidative stress can lead to mutations and chromosomal damage and genomic instability without directly breaking chemical bonds. So this provides a potential mechanism for why uh, these adverse effects might be occurring. So in IARC's overall evaluation, possibly carcinogenic, would be a 2B if there was limited evidence in human. But I wanna point out that the probable, even with limited evidence in humans, if the IARC uh, evaluation considers the animal evidence to be sufficient, this would probably be co consistent with a probable human carcinogen. To be carcinogenic to humans, IARC requires either sufficient evidence of cancer in humans or sufficient evidence of cancer in animals and strong mechanistic evidence in uh, exposed humans. Uh, it would have to wait to see what happens at the next IARC evaluation to see how uh, they classify radio frequency radiation. But what the public needs to know from all of this is that multiple studies have found increases in cancer incidents associated with exposure to radio frequency radiation in animals and humans. Now, we don't know the, the actual risks, but even if the risks are very low, this could have a serious public health impact because of the widespread use of cell phones. 
one in a million risk could would also be associated with many people uh, developing potential cancers. Uh, I believe the precautionary principle should be promoted by health and regulatory agencies, especially for children and pregnant women. Not the statement that if you are concerned, this is what you should do. And the reason I support this is because cancer risks may be greater for children than adults due to the increased penetration of cell phone radiation within the brains of children and the developing nervous system is more susceptible to tissue damaging agents. So what have we learned from this and where does it need to go? Uh, the NTP study was designed to test an assumption and found that assumption to be wrong. And I believe we should no longer assume that any current or future wireless technology, including 5G is safe without adequate testing. Uh, IARC, I believe intends to reevaluate evidence of radio frequency radiation for its carcinogenicity. And it was the FDA, again, who nominated radio frequency radiation to the NTP, and it's time that they acknowledged the results of their study that they requested and helped the FCC develop health protective exposure standards. That I thank you. <laughs>